Um, Greg, would you like to share what uh, some of those early signs you saw in Madsen? Sure. Were? So Mats is my wife, mm -hmm. all city math champion, great and strong in math, and playing like Yahtzee, adding up the numbers. Instantly, she would used to do it in her head, and I noticed she got her phone and started to add up the numbers. Now, at the time, I wasn't aware that that was an early symptom, but as, as things went on, her ability with numbers got more and more difficult, but that was the first sign that it was, it was very early. Yeah. Dr. Nash? Yes, I, I, I always say that I was accidentally diagnosed. Uh, my mother and younger brother died from Alzheimer's disease, and I decided when I reached the age of 60 that I was going to be followed by a primary care neurologist on a regular basis. And the moment I found a problem, I was going to quit practicing. So I volunteered to be in the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, ADNI 2, at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And I went up, and I remember sitting in the chair and looking out the window, and I was doing the neuropsych exam. And I, they had me, they gave me like 15 words, and I could remember about half of them. And two years before, I'd had memory testing for my long-term care insurance, and I got everything right. I got a perfect score. And, um, and from there, I had a lot of spatial problems on the, on the neuropsych exam, a lot of spatial parts. I had difficulty doing them. And I just, I knew, I, I remember getting cold and sweaty, and I knew that was a moment. I mean, I've got it. And so, um, I really, I talked to my wife and my nurse and family, friends, and fellow doctors that I worked with, and no one ever noticed anything. Patients hadn't noticed anything. I noticed a few things, real subtle, but I remember there were some patients I knew real well, and they came back for follow-up, and I, I didn't remember seeing them, but there it was. I, that's my handwriting. And, uh, and I, I didn't remember seeing either one of those. And then when I did my CME that year, my, I noticed I passed my CME, uh, but I noticed my scores had dropped off quite a bit. And it was, it was kind of alarming to me, but I just kind of passed it off. Yeah. And that, that's really all I'd noticed. But once I was diagnosed, a month later, I saw a neurologist. Once I was diagnosed, I never went back to practice. Yeah. No, that had to have been so hard to, to realize that yeah. and to stop working. So, yeah. um, You kind of touched on this, Dr. Nash, but... Greg, for yourself and Madsen, was it something that you noticed first or recognized? Was it something that she was starting to struggle with and she later came to you to share? Or how was that conversation? So her dad had Alzheimer's. She mm -hmm. was petrified of the thought of ever getting Alzheimer's. So it was something that, very fearful, but something she would never admit and certainly something she'd never talk about. When we noticed it, it, she mistook our daughter for her sister and had started to have a conversation with our daughter, Jay, calling her Diane, and it went on for you know probably only a minute, but it was just, that was the first sort of, yeah. this isn't good. And so that was the, the first time I was sort of like, this could be a problem. I'm really aware. And Sandy, Dave, um, Sandy, I think it was, you that first noticed challenges at work? Did anyone else you work with notice or? No, I think I've left. Yeah. <laughs> I really have. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, well, when you first noticed Sandy, was there any barrier to you know, having that initial conversation with your doctor? Were you able to have that conversation, easily get an appointment? Yeah, I think that y you might remember better than I did, but um, it seems like to go to the doctor and to have a checkup and to have that, you know, now we're going to have a certain number of questions and mm -hmm. answer these questions, and you all know, I'm sure, all those questions, but um, it seemed as if, I just wanted to be, you know, get an A plus on the thing. And I really thought, okay, I'll do real good. And then they said, you know, we want, we want you to remember these items, <laughs> this many items, and suggested that I remember them till the end, and I couldn't, of 
course. And, and I thought, oh, you know, I know I'm smart. I know I can do these things. So it was, it was kind of shocking to mm. not have the capacity that I used to have when yeah. it came right down to it. Shocking and probably scary too. Well, yeah, certainly yeah. wasn't me. I didn't, you know, I could do it. Dave, were you, did you want to add anything? Were mm -hmm. you at that initial appointment or? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I noticed between Sandy's conversations of having difficulty remembering, you know, important things about her clients, which, mm -hmm. you know, was a new thing, but it was continuing and maybe getting a little worse. And, and then I noticed at home, maybe she would forget a few things that I, she normally wouldn't. It was just enough to kind of add up to a point and I went through her papers and I found, you know, her doctor visits when she went to her um, primary care physician, she had a number of things to go over and one of them was memory loss. I saw it in there and um, there was a referral, one of the referrals was to a ge uh, geriatric doctor. Mm -hmm. And I remember that um, I pressed talking to the doctor about it. I know that Sandy didn't want to do it. You know, it, it wasn't acute. Um, it was tr problematical, but um, getting to that point, and I'm saying we're going to also we have a memory, you know, situation here that needs further looking at, and uh, then we got a referral. So yeah. that was um, part of the process. Yeah. Thank you both, uh, Greg. What was that initial, or was there any barrier to having that initial? Yeah. conversation with the provider? As I mentioned, Madison was so fearful, mm -hmm. the last thing she wanted to do was get checked. So the biggest barrier was her, just to yeah. say, hey, I think we should check this out. And she pushed back for probably six months before I was able to get her in. Wow, okay. Uh, and Dr. Nash, I know your situation again was a little unique, but. I was in the clinical study, I saw the neurologist um, a month later, the private neurologist, after I had my initial neurosyclist. I had already had all the diagnostic testings on the neuropsych, MRI, all the lab work we do on. And so she had all that information, plus she was head of the research program, and I saw her in a private clinic, so she had all this information. Mm -hmm. and my MOCA scores and everything. And so, Really easy. And I, I knew, I, I didn't, I heard, she didn't need to tell me that I had it. So I'd already programmed the SOMA practice down and I'd already fixed it so that when she told me I had it for sure, then I, I never went back. That was the last wow. time. That took a lot of bravery, I'm sure, to make that decision. Um, Sandy, once you had that referral to the geriatrician, um, how did that initial conversation go? Um, was there anything specific you discussed that was helpful or not? Well, I sort of kept joking around, like, why don't you tell me, ask me the question in this way, then I could tell you all about it. And, yeah. you know, I tried to bluff my way through, but that mm -hmm. wasn't going to work. Um, yeah. And I'll tell you, I can't remember what else. So okay. there's an example right there. Dave, is there anything you wanted to add about how that initial appointment with the geriatrician went? Well, the initial appointment, um, it was a series of things because I think they did an MRI, they did an assessment mm -hmm. on paper, you know, that sort of thing, question answers. And um, basically the MRIs came out, um, I don't know the technical term, but they, they were not definitive of anything. You know, in other words, she says, you're a certain age, that's, that could be anybody at your age. So we were sort of left with, you know, a question mark, but nothing resolved yeah. whatsoever on that first go round of visits. Can I ask how long ago that initial visit was? How yeah. long ago? Um, I think it was 2018. Okay, so a few years ago now. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Greg, once you were able to finally you know, get Madsen and get in to see a doctor. Um, how was that initial appointment? 
So this is something from a caregiver's perspective that is really challenging. It's so awkward to be in a doctor's office and the doctor is asking my wife who does not want to have anything to do with it or Alzheimer's and the doctor says, how you doing? She's smart enough and savvy enough to say, everything's great, I'm doing well, things are fine. And I'm sitting there thinking, can I rat her out in front of the doctor? <laughs> you know, it, puts, it put me in a very awkward spot. Yeah. I would have much rather had someone pull me aside, have me be able to articulate clearly what I'm seeing because I can't do that in front of her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a, that's a really good point, mm -hmm. and I've heard that a lot in working with different families, so thank you. Greg, what was the uh, hardest part about that appointment for you and Madsen? You want to share, yeah. Greg? Yeah. Um, for me, the hardest part is in the medical community, the doctors are so busy. The time it took from one appointment to the next to the next was just daunting. And it just, it was very emotionally difficult trying to kind of get the assessment. So, and really, realistically, from a layman's perspective, it really seems like if something were set up where you can go in and just have everything done in a week rather than six months. Uh, I don't know if that's feasible or possible, you know, certainly to get back test results, but it, it really was strung out, mainly because this, your system is so bogged down, and I understand that, but th that was the hardest part. Yeah, definitely. Um, Sandy, Dave, what was the hardest part about that initial appointment for both of you? Well, I just wanted to bluff. Yeah. Truly, I just wanted to pass the test, you know. Just yeah. So just facing it almost was the hardest part. Yeah. 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 Um, I would say the, the initial, you know, reaction to that was concern, mm -hmm. um, but not having any direction of anything. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like, well, just wait or whatever because we had no you know there was no diagnosis there was nothing else um, mm -hmm. given to us as a resource or anything I don't believe at the time um, it really took this the next visit mm -hmm. um, is that okay to talk about now or yeah, go for, of course because we went a period of time I don't remember it might have been a year it might have been some in that time frame like let's see the geriatric doctor again and, um, you know, for reassessment. And I had mm -hmm. felt that Sandy had more memory loss than she did. That was my sense. Sandy, I don't think she had a sense of it herself. I was just skating along. You know, and so it was difficult to do mm -hmm. that. I had to kind of be the person to, um, you know, kind of push a little bit, like, come on, Sand. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like ratting her out. It was like, like you yeah. said. Yeah. And um, she went through a second evaluation with the neurologist and, and the information came back from the neurologist. There's not really any big change in the scans. So we can't look at that and tell you anything. But when she did the um, little test, memory tests, they go, oh yeah, you know, last time you got all five words right, this time you got three or two or whatever. And, in talking with her, they found that there was, they could see a change. Okay. So now we were at that point. And that was about a year apart between appointments, yeah, you said? Yeah, about a year. Mm -hmm. um, and for that appointment too, um, or after that initial appointment, so you got kind of a vague diagnosis, or not really any diagnosis, and you were, just to clarify, you were kind of sent home without any real changes or recommendations until you went back for that second appointment? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Wow. So you really had to advocate for yourselves. Um, and just wanted to circle back to Dr. Nash if you wanted to, again, add if there was anything that was uh, challenging or difficult about that initial appointment or your initial no, conversation. I think, I think mainly what I said now. So I, they, I was supposed to be in the normal control group, so they put me in the MCI group, and I continued mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So I was there 
fairly regularly getting you know MRIs and blood work and neuroscience. So I had all those things done, and my wife had to go with me every time. So mm -hmm. that was monitoring. I was being monitored. I will say that my memory continued to drop off over yeah. the next three years. It, my MOCA scores kept dropping off, and they about three or four years in they leveled off, and they since climbed back up again. Okay. But, wow. And uh, was there anything that you wish had been done differently by your doctor? No, you know, one, I knew what needed to be done, and plus they were already doing it as part of the study. The only thing I yeah. had to do was that in the study, it's all blinded, so some of the stuff I had to duplicate in the private world, like my APO4 status, I'm, mm -hmm. double, I'm homozygous. And I had a spinal tap. When they did my spinal tap, they gave me some of the fluid, and I, my amyloid and tau was positive. So I was able to do that and duplicate some of those things. So I had a pretty good diagnostic workup. And then later, I had the amyloid PET scan, so I know what all that shows, and the tau scan. Yeah, you had a really thorough, thorough testing experience. The benefits have been the clinical trial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know your experience is unique, Plus I'm but on the had its benefits. Too. I'm on the adjuvant. Yeah. Um, Greg, I know you mentioned wishing that you had had a chance to speak privately with the doctor. Was there anything else that you wish had been done differently by the doctor during that initial appointment or shortly after? You know, when you don't live in a world of medicine and you come into your world, um, sometimes it's hard to track some of the vernacular, some of the, the terms, some of the, mm -hmm. um, you know, various parts of the brain. It would have helped me a lot if someone gave me the dumbed it down for the novice to be able to walk me through and, and communicate in words that were for the average person's consumption. That would have helped. Number two, it would have helped to maybe have a little bit of coaching that would have said, here's the kind of things you need to start becoming aware of. Um, you know, is your wife driving and let's, you should be concerned about driving, you should be concerned mm -hmm. about, you know, w whatever those issues are because they came up fast for me. But so maybe if there was such a thing, because the doctor doesn't have time, as having a, a coach that mm -hmm. could be assigned, which maybe that's Alzheimer's mm -hmm. LA, which became, mm -hmm. you know, a good resource for me. Yeah, yeah. It is hard though when you, it's a whole new world for you, like yeah. you said. Um, and I think sometimes when we're on the provider end, we're so used to this terminology, these things that we talk through that, that we can forget that it is an, an entirely new experience when you're getting that first diagnosis. Um, Sandy, was there anything else that you wish your doctor had done differently? Well, uh, when I was leaving the, the second um, appointment. Mm -hmm. I was told by the lady at the window, you know, the one that checks you in, mm -hmm. um, by the way, your, your doctor wants you to be in a clinical study. And I said, a clinical study for what do you mean? And that's when I got the diagnosis, was from the person in the window. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't do, do so well on that, that test with, the, you know, how many backwards by sevens and everything. Yeah. And, but, but I thought, so mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, huh? Okay. You know? So it was never directly communicated to you no. by the doctor no. after the test. No. Uh, and, and I Direct communication thought, would be helpful. And plus, which, I don't know what a clinical study is, and yeah. and I said, where do you get that clinical study? And they said, well, they're all over the place. So Dave and I <laughs> got to dial the phone do and your <laughs> own research, dial the phone until we found a clinical study, which wow. we went to, and I'm very which, glad we did. Kudos so. to you both for taking that on and finding that for yourselves because yeah. it's yeah. difficult. Uh, Dave, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, um, at, least, at least in our case, mm -hmm. the information I heard from the doctor at that second mm -hmm. 
appointment was, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, sort of like, we can't tell you you have Alzheimer's. We don't have enough information to, you know, with certainty say you have Alzheimer's. You have, it looks like it, but, you know, and that, they just kind of left it like that, kind of like, well, you know, maybe you should get in a clinical <laughs> study. It just was like backwards on things, you know? It just really yeah. kind of threw us. Yeah, so, you know, I'm hearing these themes of just more direct communication with the doctor, having a chance maybe to speak privately with the doctor mm -hmm. as well, and just more support and follow-up. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are all really big things. Uh, Sandy, was there anything that you wish you had done differently during that initial appointment? Done real good on the test. <laughs> that would have been very good. It would have. Dave? Uh, I can't top that. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I mean, I thought back and I thought, you know, we were kind of, if we were consumers of something, mm -hmm. we didn't have the background to know maybe to ask and do. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't say, uh, gee, I wish. But I, I more wish that they had said, you know, you, this is a certain area, it's not like another disease. Um, you know, you're gonna need some time and, and help, mm -hmm. you, know, transver you know, transversing through this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that kind of support. Yeah. Uh, Can I add another one? Of course. The idea that if you get a diagnosis, there ought to be a little pamphlet or something that would say, you know, yours may be different than this, or it might be this kind or that kind, mm -hmm. but you can probably um, <laughs> look forward to is not the right way to say it. <laughs> but you could probably expect what that certain expect. things mm -hmm. might happen, and yeah. so you should prepare yourself in this way. Some kind of little. So, like some basic next up, steps, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah, and something written to refer I mean, back to. We're lay people. Yeah. Can I add something to that? I just want to add one more thing is that, you know, we left there kind of, you know, wondering what to do and searching and eventually signed up with a clinical study, which, mm -hmm. you know, we've been, in, we've been in for over two years and um, we're happy about that. Um, they were the ones who did some further testing that said, yeah, you have markers for Alzheimer's in your spinal mm -hmm. fluid, for example. So they were able to do, go further yeah. and be more definitive than our HMO was. So I'm not sure why that was, maybe you know, if mm -hmm. the HMO, if they have the ability to do those further steps, maybe they, yeah. they could have, I don't know. Insurance can be a barrier sometimes. I know being in the clinical study too, that's how you got a very, I think some thorough testing done, Dr. Nash. Um, was there anything that you wish that you had done differently, Dr. Nash? No, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of lucky. I'm lucky that I decided to go up and get evaluated because I mm -hmm. always wondered when would I had trouble in my practice. Would it have been two years yeah. later, three years? When was it? And I wasn't doing the things I needed to be doing to make myself better. And yeah. I would have missed out. Thank you. Um, Greg, was there anything that you wish you had done differently? In hindsight, I would have gotten started earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, thank you. Uh, after, Sandy, after that appointment, you were given that, sorry, after that second appointment, let's mm -hmm. say, you were given that diagnosis, told that you should consider a, a clinical trial. Um, what did you do next after that? Was there a gap between your next appointment or kind of what was your follow-up? <laughs> well, you found a trial? Where do you find clinical trial mm -hmm. for Alzheimer's in the phone book? You know, I mean, it, it, it was kind of hard. And, and we called UCLA and we called um, USC and UCLA didn't call back. So... USC won. <laughs> By default. <laughs> yeah, ironically, when I think it was the U UCLA group didn't call back, we called them, say, well, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, we forgot to call you. <laughs> I thought that was ironic for Alzheimer's. It was, it was just sad, yeah. 
you know, they're probably very good at a lot of things, but <laughs> that one little paper that got lost or something. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, 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 and it was a pretty good, heavy duty. Yeah, do you want to share about the trial you did, Sandy? The, well, the trial that I guess I'm in for, mm -hmm. for the rest of my life is um, that they did surgery where they stuck a, a gizmo in my chest Oh, I'm going to say it wrong. But a little gizmo in my chest. And then it has a tube that goes up my neck. And, and it connects to, between the two hemispheres of my brain, to the mm -hmm. fornix in your brain. And it stimulates it to a level that's um, correct for me. Do you remember when they, yeah. well, there was a machine and they would keep upping it. And pretty soon I was... <laughs> You know, really, that's too much of whatever that is. So, um, but when they did that, they suited it to me, mm -hmm. and that was after the year, after yeah. the first year of having it. And then they adjusted it to be just right for me. Good. And, and I'm so smart now. <laughs> no, I'm, oh, I'm not really you. smart, but I'm kind of smart. Smarter than I was, anyway. Best sense of humor. <laughs> um, let's see, Greg, after that initial appointment, was there, uh, what were your next steps, or what happened next? Um, so we did, a, I fortunately have an uncle that's at uh, Keck, and he, um, Got me in right away when I finally said, here's what's going on. Got the MRI done, and from the MRI, had it set up with the neuropsychological testing, and then the, um, the cognitive neurological, and then did a blood test, did a lumbar tap, mm -hmm. did um, the genetic testing. So, I mean, in hindsight, in talking to other people, I've realized I was really treated pretty well, and it probably happened pretty quickly. It's just that it seemed like at the time a long time to get through all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, there definitely was a process in place. There definitely was um, smart people helping us navigate mm -hmm. the system. So maybe even just knowing what to have expected though, like time timeline, yeah. what tests, all of that, so you could have known that it was right. a good pace would have been helpful too. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Nash, uh, what were the next steps for you after that initial appointment? You stayed involved in that study, right? Yeah, I stayed, I stayed in the ADNI study mm -hmm. for uh, five years. Uh, I, I got on Aircept, suffered through the first month, and stayed on it since then. Um, I got tested, neuropsychs, whatever time frame it was, and MOCA tests and MSC. MSC. Uh, I didn't like being a patient. I mean, suddenly I'm from being a doctor, I'm thrown back as a patient. Yeah. And we do not do a very good job as physicians in, in our offices. Uh, and then, uh, like I said before, my, my memory dropped off. It, it tapered off about uh, three years out. Mm -hmm. I remember my wife was in the room crying with the research director because I had deteriorated some. But I got real aggressive in my health. You know, we had talked about it and yeah. my health and we um, fixed my, I had a low B12 and vitamin D, I fixed all that. And I got pretty aggressive, very, got real aggressive in my health, uh, uh, physically active, mentally active, socially active. And it just, it's kind of kicked in. And from, from there, I was able to, uh, uh, transition into the biogenes of Duquesne mouth study, and I started getting infusions Yeah. Uh, back in 2017. And I don't know if you mentioned this. Do you want to share when you, how long ago you got that initial testing done, that initial uh, diagnosis? It was 2010. Yeah. That's so 2010, and my memory testing dropped off. I can, that's the only test I get to see is my MOCA test, because I, mm -hmm. when I do the exam, I score it myself. <laughs> Good idea. I learned how to cheat and look at the record, <laughs> but but my my scores dropped down and they got down to like 25, 24, mm -hmm. 25, and I know I was noticing things and they 
kicked up now. My last, the last two or three years have been in the third. I'm a, I'll get a perfect score. Wow. Mm. So I, I mean, I don't know. I know my diagnosis is right because I have a amyloid scan that's positive. Yeah. My spinal cap's positive. Wow. Time will tell. And uh, you mention this because you do have the background as a provider yourself. Um, so with that background and then now going through this, do you have any advice or suggestions for how families dealing with cognitive uh, decline can better advocate for themselves? Well, first, the, the problem that they had getting worked out mm -hmm. is I, I've been in communication with people the last 12 years. They're always contacting me, people I don't even know from all over the United States. And, and they say, I got these memory issues, and I kind of pre-program what, what to do to be ready to go in for their doctor's visit. So I would have pre-programmed you, so you would have been all ready, and he would have you'd saved you a lot of time. I'd just do it, you know, they just happened to contact me. Yeah. So I have them do, you know, some online uh, questionnaires on the patient and, and be all ready and copy that and take it in, and I tell them what to make sure they got their records all their medical information correctly and then go in and, and they make sure they go in with the patient don't go by themselves. Yeah. And that's really helped a lot of people. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Um, Greg, is there any, any advice or suggestions you have for how families can better advocate for themselves? In, in my particular case, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to find a cure. So I did a lot of research and a lot of study and read a lot of books and Google. I, I really had too much information and a lot of information you get turns out to probably not be backed up by good data. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been good for me to probably have less search myself and find a few advocates that can help me narrow down that mm -hmm. focus because I just was doing too much and trying to, um, and really a lot of it in hindsight was a, a waste of time. Yeah, it's like information overload yeah. if you look it up yeah, yourself, sure. yeah. Um, Dave, anything you think that could be done to better advocate for, families can do to better advocate? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking right now. I'm not, I'm not yeah. totally sure. I, I, it is kind of like, uh, Difficult just to know how to do the research, what you're, you know, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, I think I know just in general, just being at the doctor's office, we've yeah. had to advocate just to slow them down so they are, you know, they're listening. Yeah. You know, and and it's a gentle process, but I found that it can be done in a gen, you know, generally speaking, just to get that little more time when you're visiting that maybe everything doesn't get answered at that moment mm -hmm. and you're left with questions, but at least that's your reality at the, at the moment. Yeah, I think that's great advice, thank you. Uh, Sandy, anything you wanna add that you think would help people better advocate for themselves? Uh, sure, I think that one of the things that I like to do is take naps, I think you know, to be able to be in your body and know what's going on and, mm -hmm. and one day take a long walk together and mm -hmm. the next day take a nap and the next day read up on stuff and, you know, yeah. whatever is, and, and I think, you know, COVID really helped with what do you feel like doing today because mm -hmm. we're all kind of up in the air with that anyway. Um, but I would say just be true to yourself. I realized that there's a lot of stuff that I'm not going to be doing anymore, but what can I do? What can I do? Yeah. And I ended up writing um, haikus in my sleep, <laughs> waking up yeah. and writing them down. So, you know, what, what it's going to be for each person is different, mm -hmm. but if they can be creative at the level of functioning they've got, that's going to be really helpful. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, and then, Sandy, back to you. Do you yeah. have any final thoughts or things that you'd like to share about your diagnostic experience or what this, this journey has been like so far? Uh, yeah. Uh, when you tell, when a person gets the news that they have 
they might have mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. They're not just telling that person, they're telling that person about their own children. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, I mean, it's, it's a sad thing. It's truly a sad thing to have yeah. Alzheimer's. But when you have three children and they have children, you realize that landed on you like a giant rock because your whole yeah. family is going down the tubes. And that's yeah. really hard. I mean, I wish they could say, you have Alzheimer's, but there's a guarantee that your children and your children's children will not have it because of the new mm -hmm. studies that we're doing. I, I mean, I wish there was something like that. But yeah. for a mother, at least, and I don't know how it would be for men to hear that same thing. Anything you wanted to add to that, Dave? It's, it's a lot about support system for everybody who's yeah. either directly or tangentially connected. And, and you have to learn a lot. I mean, that's one thing I've learned mm -hmm. is that when Alzheimer's or another cognitive disease is, is present, um, your life has changed. And, mm -hmm. and you're almost, it's almost incumbent upon yourself to not just be your normal, whatever way you've been in the past. So um, I found this time actually the plus side is I've gained a lot of insight into not only myself, but other people and what mm -hmm. life is about and all that. So whether it comes from you spiritually or you know, however you want to do it, um, support groups, we're part of this Alzheimer's LA support group. That's like, it's a, a life raft. You know, you're floating in a stormy sea sometime, but you know you're in a raft. So just support wherever you can get it. And if it's part of your medical you know, team, that's mm -hmm. a bonus. Thank you both for sharing that. Uh, Greg, any final thoughts or things you wanted to share? You know, I'll piggyback on that thought of support group. And, and Alzheimer LA, the, the, the one thing they advocated was building up a team. That's been very useful. And, and just going to these, you know, uh, Zoom talks, there's always someone that, you know, has the same problem. My wife goes on huge walks all the time. I don't know where she is, but now I've got a tracker because one of the guys in the group said, get this kind of tracker. Um, driving a car, just how to get her from driving a car when she does not want to give it up. Again, having that support group that can give you input. So what I have found is there's, there's this process we're going through. And for me, th these other panelists are doing great. Uh, my wife is progressing much more rapidly. And I, every time I feel like I'm on top of it, things change. So yeah. having a support group you can go to and ask those kind of questions are, are very helpful. So it, I'd start with Alzheimer's LA as, as a place to recommend that they, they go to. Thank you. And Dr. Nash, any uh, final thoughts or things you'd like to share with everyone? I think. <clears throat> If you're a provider, you should listen to your patients. You should listen to your patients. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a patient and you have, think you have memory issues, you should get it evaluated as soon as possible. Um, make sure your provider listens to you. If they don't listen to you, go somewhere else, like these people did. And make sure that you have a good, thorough evaluation done so you know mm -hmm. your accuracy. It's sad to see people that have some treatable disease that got missed for five years because they were told they had Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. I've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, make sure you had a good, good thorough evaluation. So, thank you. And I'll also do a clinical trials like we're all in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, I want to once again thank all of you for joining us and sharing your experiences with everyone. We really do. I appreciate your time and your honesty, so thank you all. Thank you.